The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. In Luke 16, 9, Jesus said, And so I tell you this, use unrighteous mammon to make friends for yourselves, and thus make sure that when it fails you, they will welcome you into the tabernacles of eternity. Now, the Greek word in Luke 16, 9 that's translated tabernacles is the plural form of the Greek word skene, which is the word used throughout the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, where it's sometimes translated home or dwelling or dwelling place, but most often it's translated tabernacle with specific reference to the tabernacle that was built by Moses. And I'm persuaded that that evocation by the Lord is deliberate in Luke 16. Because there's no sense of the word skene in reference to a house or a tent or a residence in any ordinary usage of those words that would fit the context of Luke 16:9. After all, the skenas to which Jesus refers in this passage are the tents of eternity or the tents of the age to come. So, to what was Jesus referring in Luke 16, 9 when He referred to the tabernacles of eternity? Well, as you may recall from some previous lessons that I preached on the parable of the unjust steward six or seven years ago, I'm sure it's very clear in your memory, <laughs> we know that Jesus here is not referring to the heavenly tabernacle spoken of in Hebrews 9, because Jesus' reference to the tabernacles of eternity is distinctly plural, and one of the distinguishing features of the heavenly tabernacle is that it is singular, it is unique, it is one of kind. Likewise, we discussed the possibility that the tabernacles of eternity here are the mansions of glory that Jesus has gone to heaven to prepare for us. And that remains a workable possibility. However, I'm persuaded that Jesus has something else entirely in mind when He speaks of the tabernacles of eternity in Luke 16:9. As you know, God has an abiding desire to dwell in the midst of His people. And the Bible is replete with examples of God doing that very thing by inhabiting spaces that His people had constructed for Him. For instance, God inhabited the open space constructed for Him by Abraham in Genesis 15:17, when Abraham set out an esplanade of bifurcated sacrifices, and God came and passed between the sacrificed carcass halves in order to ratify His covenant with Abraham. Again, God inhabited the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of Moses, which was located at the center of the Israelite camp, which camp followed the presence of God wherever it went. And again, God inhabited the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. And this third inhabitation God undertook even though He had certain misgivings about the temple itself. As we read in 1 Chronicles 17, 3-5, but it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, You shall not build for me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I raised up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent, and from one tabernacle to another. Nevertheless, when his people pleaded with him to allow them to build him a house, he relented, and at their behest he inhabited that house. And even though we read in Ezekiel 8 through 11 of God withdrawing from the temple of Solomon, and we have no record of him taking up residence in the second temple, we know that he did abide in the second temple. Jesus himself gives indirect testimony to this fact, as does the Bible. For instance, if God did not inhabit the Holy of Holies in Herod's temple, then the rending of the curtain upon the death of Christ would have been meaningless. God has always desired to tabernacle among his people. And in the fullness of time, the Son of God came to earth and inhabited a tabernacle of human flesh. As God Himself prophesied in Leviticus 26, 3, 9, 10, and 11, If you walk in My statutes and keep My commandments and perform them, I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm My covenant with you. You shall eat up the old harvest and clear out the old in deference to the new. I will set up my tabernacle among you, and my spirit shall not fail to thrive among you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people." Which prophecy was fulfilled in the incarnation of Christ. As John tells us in John 1, 1 1-4 and 14, "...in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made." In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word that's translated tabernacled here is the verbal form of the word skene, tabernacle. When the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and the power of the Most High overshadowed her, and she conceived in her womb and bore a child, the holy conceptus that was born unto her was the second person of the Godhead dwelling in a tabernacle of human flesh. Matthew 1.23, And behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And for the next thirty some odd years, God dwelt in a closer proximity to His people than He had ever done before. Then at last, when Jesus ascended into heaven, He sent His Holy Spirit, who tabernacles in the bodies of all Christians. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 132, 1-8, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the Mighty One of Jacob, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house, or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, or slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the Mighty One of Jacob. For behold, we heard it in Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem, It lit upon us in the fields, it lit upon us in the woods, that we might be numbered among His tabernacles, that we might worship at His footstool. Fix your resting place in us, O Lord, even as you fixed it on the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed in righteousness, let your saints shout for joy. And so it is with every one of us, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? And again in 1 Corinthians 6, 18-19, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore honor God with your bodies. The Spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, which once took up residence in His own tabernacle of human flesh, has now taken up residence in these tabernacles of human flesh. And that same Holy Spirit is sanctifying us from within, that we might be sanctified from without for all eternity. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 1-5, For we know that if the earthly tabernacle we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing for the day when we will be clothed over with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are so clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tabernacle, we groan and are burdened, but not because we wish to be unclothed, but rather because we wish to be clothed over with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing this very outcome. And again in 1 Corinthians 15, 42-45, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. For just as surely as there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. As it is written, the first man Adam became a living soul, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But we don't have to wait until the last day to begin to catch a glimpse of this process, which is already at work within us and upon us. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, And the Lord said to me, My grace inhabits you with unfailing strength, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may be tabernacled upon me as well. What are the tabernacles of eternity to which Jesus refers in Luke 16, 9? Well, we're living in them right now. Our mortal bodies are the tabernacles of eternity in the making. We are living right here and right now in the very bodies which will someday be clothed over with immortality, and will become glorified flesh, spiritual bodies, sanctified from within and from without. And that reality is a reality precisely because while we are the primary inhabitants of our bodies, we are not the sole inhabitants of our bodies. 
In John 15, 4, Jesus said, Abide in me, even as I abide in you. And what does it mean for us to abide in Christ? Well, Christ gives us one very important piece of information that ought to help us understand what that means. Because according to Jesus, the sense in which we abide in Him is the same as the sense in which He abides in us. When Jesus said, Abide in me even as I abide in you, that was not a metaphor. Remember, in Philippians 1, 3-7, Paul said to the saints at Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your reciprocation with me in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I am completely justified in feeling this way about all of you because I have you in my heart both in my bonds and in my defense of the gospel, for you are all mutual partakers with me in grace. And I can tell you with confidence that contrary to many interpretations of this passage, when Paul tells the Philippians that he has them in his heart, that is not a poetic way of saying that he loves them. Now he does love them, but that isn't his meaning. And it can't be his meaning. Of that I'm certain, because if we were to take the words, I have you in my heart here to mean I love you, then we would have no choice but to intuit from what Paul says in verses 6 and 7, either that Paul believes that his love for the Philippians stands as evidence of their salvation, or that his love for them has the power to bring about their salvation. But both of those propositions are completely preposterous. Paul would not say any such thing, and he did not say any such thing. No, what Paul is doing here is building a case. He's making an argument, and the argument that he's making is that he who began a good work of salvation in the Philippians will carry it on to completion until the day of the Lord. And the proof that he gives to substantiate this claim is his testimony that he has the Philippians in his heart, which testimony as he presents it completely justifies his confidence that the Philippians will all be perfected on the day of the Lord. The only way that I can see for that to make any sense is if Paul is speaking literally when he says that he has the Philippians in his heart. Remember, grace is not God being nice. Grace is God being God in us. Grace is the power of God, the dunamis of God at work within us. Grace is the energy of God, the energia of God at work within us, which grace comes to every one of us every believer as the permanent lading, as the permanent cargo of the Holy Spirit. Which Holy Spirit resides in our bodies, in our physical bodies, in our hearts, in our cardia? And that isn't a metaphor, that's a cardiopulmonary reality. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 6-11, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has made the light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. All Christians have, living in our bodies, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, and with His Spirit, His grace. And His Spirit is not divided among us, it is shared among us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 and 17, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? For everyone who is united with the Lord is of one spirit in Him. And again in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. The Holy Spirit is not divided among us. The Spirit is shared among us, and our bodies are the plenum in which the Spirit dwells. Now for those of you who don't know, a plenum is the opposite of a vacuum. In physics, it's a space filled with matter as opposed to a space devoid of matter. 
In engineering, it's used, for instance, to refer to the air ducts in a forced air HVAC system. In theology, at least in my theology, it refers to the church, the body of Christ on earth, which is comprised of the bodies of Christians on earth, which bodies are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the plenum in which the Holy Spirit abides, and the Spirit is not divisible. The Spirit isn't divided out to us individually. The one Spirit unites us into one being, unites us into one organism by inhabiting all of us at the same time. And as I've told you many times, this is not unlike a similar reality that we have all experienced whenever we have found ourselves in an enclosed space with other people, such as an elevator. Because I don't know about you, but I'm something of a germaphobe. And when I find myself in an enclosed space with others, I become acutely aware that I'm having a kind of unwilling intimacy with the other people in that space. Because they, not me of course, but they are breathing out pathogens that I suspect are not helpful for me. And I am breathing them in. And in that moment, the occupants of that enclosed space become the plenum for those pathogens. And though that illustration is negative, it wouldn't be negative if one of the people on that elevator were breathing out a pathogen that could cure all of our diseases. Well, beloved, that is exactly the reality that is presented to us in Scripture in regard to the church and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is the factor that makes the church and all Christians collectively as a body a plenum rather than a vacuum. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into our bodies just as literally as God breathed the Spirit of life, the human spirit of Adam, into His body. And in that Spirit, and in the permanent lading of the Spirit, which is grace, we have fellowship. We have intimacy with one another in a way that is just as tangible, just as tactile, just as real as we do with pathogen-breathing strangers on an elevator. As a matter of fact, Peter and Paul both use that very word, the word pathema, from which we get the word pathogen to describe the power of grace at work within us and among us. Philippians 3, 10 through 11, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His pathema, becoming like Him in His death, that by this means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 6-7, But if we are afflicted, it is for your calling and salvation, in which you receive the enduring energy of the same pathema, which we also experience. And if we are comforted, it is for your calling and salvation. Thus our hope for you is steadfast. For we know that if you participate together with us in our pathema, that you also participate together with us in our calling. 1 Peter 4, 12-13, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, for you are participating in the pathema of Christ, so that you may thrive when His glory is revealed. And that is the reality of life together in Christ that I think is in view in Philippians 1, 6-7. As Paul seems to understand the matter, Christian participation in the grace of Jesus Christ is a deeply intimate, interspiritual, and interbodily experience. Grace doesn't come to believers in a vacuum. Grace comes to believers in a plenum, a plenum in which we all participate through the Holy Spirit, which lives in our hearts, in our cardia. And through that fellowship, we participate in one another's very beings, body, and spirit. So when Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians 1, 6-7, I am completely confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, and I know this for a fact because I have you in my heart. What he is testifying to is a reality that he is experiencing. The Philippians are in his heart. And as far as Paul is concerned, that stands as empirical evidence that they are in fact and in truth saved that Christ in fact and in truth dwells in their hearts. Because the only way that they could possibly have come to reside in Paul's heart, the only way that their human spirit could possibly be cohabitating with his human spirit in his cardia is through the plenum of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, through the plenum of grace. Which is exactly what Paul goes on to say in the second half of Philippians 1.7, I am completely justified in feeling this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. 
both in my bonds and in my defense of the gospel, for you are all mutual partakers with me in grace. That's the nature, the actual nature, the tactile nature, the palpable nature of the spiritual reality and the physical reality of the fellowship of grace. All Christians abide in one another precisely because Christ abides in us. And that brings us back to John 15. When Jesus says in John 15, 4, Abide in me, even as I abide in you, He's doing more than bidding us to remain in fellowship with Him. Now, He's doing that to be sure, but also, and more importantly for today's lesson, He's telling us something. He's telling us what it means to abide in Him. He's telling us what it really looks like, what shape it takes. He's telling us in what sense we are to abide in Him. And according to Jesus, we abide in Him in the same sense that He abides in us. Now, if that's right, if Jesus understands this correctly, and if I understand Jesus correctly, then that means that we abide in His heart in the same sense that He abides in ours, and in the same sense that we abide in one another's hearts, through the plenum of the Holy Spirit, through the plenum of grace. That is the literal reality of abiding in Christ. There's nothing figurative about it. After all, where is the body of Christ right now? The physical body of Christ. Remember, the tomb was empty. The testimony of the apostles is not that the body of Christ died, but His Spirit lived on. No, the testimony of the apostles is that Jesus rose from the dead, body and spirit, and that over a period of 40 days He was seen and seen and seen again. And He wasn't just seen, but He was heard and touched. He was not only touched with the apostles' hands, but He also touched others with His hands. And He handled objects, and He ate. He even cooked breakfast for seven of the apostles one morning on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. Now His body was changed. It was glorified. So the body of Christ is different now than it was when He died. But make no mistake about it, it's still His body. And according to the Bible, He's still in it. He didn't leave it behind when He ascended to the heavenly places. No, if I understand the matter correctly, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over the inaugurated kingdom of God in glorified flesh. And whatever that glorified flesh is like, whatever that body is like, and I don't claim to know exactly what it's like, but whatever it's like, if I understand John 15, 4 correctly, then that body has within it a heart, the heart of Jesus. And His heart is inhabited by us, just as surely as our hearts are inhabited by Him. And in the same sense, in the same manner, in the self-same way that our hearts are inhabited by Him, through the plenum of the Holy Spirit, through the plenum of grace. Those, as I understand the matter, are the bare facts of the reality that's in view when Jesus says, Abide in Me, even as I abide in you. Now that brings us to where we left off last week. Because last week we were addressing the question of whether Jerusalem in general, and the Kingsdale in particular, should properly be considered simply as land or as holy land. And I began to answer that question by making an analogy between our bodies and Jerusalem. And this analogy is more fitting than you might think. I mean, you take a young child to a funeral, and the child asks, What is Grandpa doing in that box? And you answer, Well, that isn't Grandpa, that's just his body. Grandpa, the real Grandpa, is in heaven with Jesus. What's in that box is just a shell, just a casing that your grandfather lived in for 90 years. But he doesn't need that anymore, because now he's free from his body, and his spirit is in heaven. Now that satisfies the child, but it isn't right, is it? I mean, Grandpa may very well be with Jesus, but he isn't in heaven. He's in paradise. He won't go to heaven until the last day and the final judgment. Now, in paradise, He is in spirit only. His spirit is in paradise, and His body is in the grave. But His body is not merely a shell. His body is every bit as much Him as is His spirit. Remember, the Bible makes two distinct propositions about what happened to Jesus when He died. He was received into the hands of the Father in paradise, and he was buried in a tomb where he remained for three days and three nights until he rose from the dead. And both of those propositions have to be true. Now, how can that be? Well, that can be because it conforms to the fundamentals of the human constitution. 
When God created Adam, He first created a creature of dust. But the creature of dust was not a human being. It was not until God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of the creature of dust that He became a human being, that He became a living soul. A living soul is a whole human being, a whole person, body, and spirit. And a whole person is an integrated being, a human body integrated with a human spirit. And death, biblically speaking, is always defined as the disintegration of a whole person. When a person's spirit and body are separated from one another, death occurs. Then the body goes to the grave, and the spirit, in the case of the saved, goes to paradise. And both are still you. Your body is every bit as much you as is your spirit. If this were not so, then Jesus was not buried, and did not spend three days and three nights in the grave. His body did. But that isn't what happened. When Jesus rose from the dead, His spirit and His body were reintegrated, and He rose, body and spirit, from the grave. And according to the Bible, it will be the same for us when we rise from the dead. We too will rise, body and spirit, from the grave, fully reintegrated and fully glorified. Our spirits glorified, never to sin again. Our bodies glorified, never to die again. And of what is your body made? Of what is it comprised? Well, if you trace it back far enough to the first man, Adam, the human body is made from the dust of the earth, from the elements of the earth, from the dirt, from the ground. And what is the status of our bodies right now? Are our bodies merely the shells in which we, the real self, dwells? No. Our bodies are us, just as surely as our spirits are us. Now let that sink in for a minute and allow that truth to become generalized in your way of thinking. The raw material out of which the glorified body of Christ is made constitutionally is His mortal body, the body of His incarnation. The raw material out of which our glorified bodies will be made constitutionally are our mortal bodies, the bodies that we are right now, which are the tabernacles of eternity in the making. The raw material out of which the new heaven will be made, constitutionally, is the current heaven. The raw material out of which the new earth will be made, constitutionally, is the current earth. These four corpi, or corpuses, have something in common. They are all as they are right now. They are all undergoing transformation right now. And they will all be redeemed on the last day. And in all these cases, what that redemption involves is taking these things as they are and transfiguring them into what they ought to be. Which transfiguration, which transformation will be done by the energy of God the Father? Which energy is glory? That's what glorification is. That's how glorification works. But there's something missing from this list. There's a fifth corpus that according to the Bible will be glorified on the last day. At last count, there are 4,037 major cities in the world. 4,037 cities with populations over 100,000. But of those 4,000 or so, there's only one city named in the Bible that will be glorified on the last day and become part of the fabric of the age to come. And that city is Jerusalem. And to my mind, that seems significant. Because we tend to look at a place like Jerusalem and we say, well, a lot of historical biblical events took place in Jerusalem, but it's just a place. It's just a location where a great deal of spiritual activity took place. But the space itself isn't special. It isn't even the real Jerusalem. Because the real Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, will be spiritual. Well, that's what people say. But that's also what people say about Grandpa's body lying in the casket at his funeral. That isn't your grandfather, it's just his body. The real grandpa is in heaven with Jesus. Well, people are wrong about grandpa. Could it be that they're also wrong about Jerusalem? Come back next week and I'll tell you. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30.
We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.